Welcome. This is the online course on the Nibbana Sermons 1 to 11 by Bhikkhu Katakurunda Nyanananda, course hosted by the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Hamburg in collaboration with the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts. And today we will look at sermon number nine. But before that, I have just a few comments still related to the previous lecture. One is something I wanted to quote that Matt Weingas said on Sankaras. He said, by seeing through the many ways in which we construct identities around what happens to us or others, we are freed from these mental constructions. The past remains, and even to some extent the houses we have built in and out of the past, but we no longer build new houses and no longer visit the old ones. I thought that was very beautiful. And then Hedwig Krenn, a comment, she said, the interpretation of birth by the Venerable Katakurunda Nyanananda is only supported in one passage in the Pali Suttas and not in the Agamas or elsewhere. How can we or the Venerable Katakurunda Nyanananda be sure of this interpretation, which makes a lot of sense to me? Indeed. Still, I feel that if it is only one passage in a sutta, there should be more backup for this interpretation. Yeah, I thought that that uh, was a good point, and this is precisely, uh, I think, the contribution that I am trying to make in giving these, giving always giving the parallels to certain passages. And Venerable Nyanananda, obviously, at the time when he was giving these talks, the comparative perspective had not yet been really developed. So he is basing his insightful presentation on the Pali Suttas and on his own practice and insight. And so at times it is helpful for us to simply see how far a certain passage is similarly in the parallels or is, 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 is not found in them. And in the case of the interpretation of birth of Jati, what I try to convey with the simile of the of the ruler and and the cup was precisely the problem that uh, the entire series of twelve links does not fit uh, smoothly into a time-wise interpretation, but also does not fit smoothly into a interpretation that leaves out the element of time completely. And in my understanding the term jati uh, really refers to actual birth. And so from birth to old age and death, I think it is, in my personal uh, take, uh, I, I find it difficult to see how this could not refer to an actual human birth, a human becoming old and eventually passing away. And so there is in, this is just my take. There is a time element in that part of Patichasamupada. But as I also tried to, uh, as I tried to show, at the, I think it was the fourth lecture when we had this, that the earlier part of the 12 link formula is, is very difficult to read this as a time sequence. And, I, and so the solution then really comes to see that it is neither because it is a composite, is a composite of like one part, the early part of the 12 link formulation, which is uh, which stands in dialogue, which uh, with an idea apparently in circulation in ancient India, namely this Vedic creation myth, and the later part is the Buddhist adaptation or how, 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 how the Buddha goes on from this part that mirrors the creation myth to, to pointing out that this is actually uh, ends up in the creation of, of Dukkha. And so from that purpose it is best not to not, not, not to uh, try to fit it into either of these two molds from Within, from which, or from the perspective of which the Patichasamapada has been uh, uh, explained. 
And in terms of charity, I mean, I think it is still significant that we have that interpretation in one party discourse, that the Arya Pariyasan Sutta clearly considers uh, jati in this more broad manner. So this is a significant point. And the fact that it is not found in the parallel does not automatically mean it, it's necessarily wrong. It just means that as an evidence for early Buddhist thought in the sense of the attempt to come as close as possible to the original delivery of teachings by the Buddha and his disciples, this is weaker than it would be if it is also found in the parallel. So we might assume that perhaps the Madhyama Agama parallel has lost the reference to birth, or the Pali version has added it. And right now, offhand, I don't see a decisive argument in favor of any of these two hypotheses. And so what this comparative study in a way does is instead of uh, just this black and white yes and no, it, it makes us position things like something somewhere in front. This is what we have in all the parallel version where we can be, be, be sure this represents early Buddhism and some things are more at the background. They're still there. We don't, we don't chuck them out, but they, they are not as strong. And so in the case of the interpretation of Jadi, we just have to say, well, there is one passage that supports such an interpretation, but it is not found in the parallel. So it's not as strong evidence as it would be if it were also found in the parallels. Yeah, that was what I had from the discussion on the forum. And then there was also one thing I wanted to share which relates to one uh, very important point in my view that the Venmanyanananda will be making in this ninth sermon, namely on the question of the importance of insight into and contemplation of impermanence as a foundational insight for the cultivation of liberation. And this importance given to impermanence in early Buddhist thought and practice is sometimes being lost out of focus in later tradition. And I wanted to share something. This is from just as an example for this different perspective on impermanence. This is from Rob Rubea, seeing that frees meditations on emptiness and dependent arising. So he's writing on two topics that are very very important also in this in this talks by Venamanyanananda, but his perspective is quite different. So on this is page 159, he says, where there is still some unchallenged belief in impermanence or impermanence as being ultimately true, there will remain as something unfulfilled through that. A dimension of freedom that is possible to know will be inaccessible. And this is page 356. A belief in Anicca as ultimately true implies, as well as a belief in the ultimate reality of time, a belief in and a seeing in terms of the existence and non-existence of things. The two extreme views avoided by the Buddha's middle way of emptiness. And if things do not either really exist or really not exist, then an assertion of their impermanence is ultimately untenable. Yeah, this is a very, very different perspective on impermanence than what we find in the early discourses. And from an early Buddhist perspective, from the viewpoint of the Kachaya Nagata Sutta, this uh, argument made here is uh, untenable. The question is not that uh, uh, the impermanence is being denied, but only the Kachaya Gotna Sutta is only about existence and non-existence, and then the middle path of dependent arising, which is precisely about the impermanent nature of phenomena. And so this perspective on impermanence and also a few other aspects in this book, which is otherwise is a very interesting book, uh, unfortunately, uh, quite contrary to early Buddhist understanding and practice. And this is just as an example to prepare for the clarification that the Venomanyanananda 
will be giving in this sermon on the importance of impermanence. So with this much by way of preparation, we are now ready to get into sermon number nine. Hitang santang etang panitang yadidang sabba sankara samato sab upadi padini sango tanhangayo virago nirodho nibbanam. This is peaceful. This is excellent. Namely, the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. With the permission of the most venerable great preceptor and the assembly of the venerable meditative monks. This is the ninth sermon in the series of sermons given on the topic of Nibbana. In our last sermon we discussed to some extent how the insubstantiality and the vanity of the comic acts enacted by sangsadic beings in this drama of existence gradually becomes clear to a meditator as he keeps his postures according to the Satipatthana Sutta. We mentioned how the fact that name is only a shadow of form is revealed to the meditator when he is attending to his postures, seeing the elements constituting the basis of form as empty. By way of analogy, we brought in the simile of a mime or a dumb show, what characterizes that kind of drama is the comic nature of the acts, which depict scenes suggestive of animate or inanimate objects not actually present on the stage. A meditator becomes aware, while attending to his postures, that he is merely enacting a dumb show. He comes to understand how far a name is dependent on form, and the four elements appear to him as empty. In the Satipatthana Sutta, we find the following instruction in regard to the keeping of postures. Yathayatava panasakaya panihituhoti tathatatanang pajanati. In whatever way his body is disposed, so he understands it. This is suggestive of the attempt of a spectator to understand the mimicry of an actor or an actress in a pantomime. While attending to one's postures, one feels as if one is watching a one-man dumb show. One gets an opportunity to watch it even more keenly when one comes to the section on full awareness, Sampajanya Pabba, dealing with the minor postures, Kodraka Iriyapata. The whirlings are in the habit of creating material objects in accordance with the factors on the name side in a very, in an extremely subtle manner by grasping the four elements under the influence of personality view, Sankhaya Dikti. The material objects around us are recognized as such by grasping the four elements. The definition of the form aspect in name and form points to such a conclusion. Chattantara cha mahabhota, chattunnan cha mahabhota nang upadaya rupam. The four great primaries and form dependent on those four primaries. The word upadaya in this context has a special connotation of a relativity. So in this way, material objects are created with the help of factors in the name group. This reveals a certain principle of relativity. In this relativity, one sees the emptiness of both name and form. This same principle of relativity is implicit in some other statements of the Buddha, but they are rather neglected for lack of recognition of their significance. We come across such a discourse with a high degree of importance in the Salaya Tanavanga of the Samyutta Nikaya. There the Buddha states that principle of relativity with the help of an illustration. When there are hands, monks, a taking up and putting down is apparent. When there are feet, a going forward and coming back is apparent. When there are joints, a bending and stretching is apparent. 
When there is a belly, hunger and thirst is apparent. Then the contrary of this situation is also given. Hatte so bhikkavi asati, adana nitke panam na panyayati. Pade so asati, abhikkama patikkamo na panyayati. Pabbe so asati, saminjana pasara na panyayati. Kuchisming asati, jinga chapi pasa na panyayati. When there are no hands, taking up and putting down is not apparent. When there are no feet, a going forward and coming back is not apparent. When there are no joints, a bending and stretching is not apparent. When there is no belly, hunger and thirst are not apparent. What is implied by all this is that basic principle of relativity. Comment, translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. When there are hands, picking and putting down, are discerned. When there are feet, coming and going are discerned. When there are limbs, bending and stretching are discerned. When there is the belly, hunger and thirst are discerned. When there are no hands, picking and putting down, picking up and putting down are not discerned. When there are no feet, coming and going are not discerned. When there are no limbs, bending and stretching are not discerned. When there is no belly, hunger and thirst are not discerned. And I have just added the relevant passage in the Chinese parallel, which proceeds similarly. <clears throat> Some meditators engaged in Satipatthana meditation might think that materiality does not really exist, and only mentality is there. In other words, there are no hands, only a taking up and putting down is there. There are no feet, only a going and coming is there. That way, they might dogmatically take the bare activity as real and subject it to an analysis. But what is important here is the understanding of the relativity between the two, which reveals yes. the emptiness of both. If, on the other hand, one of them is taken too seriously as real, it ends up in a dogmatic standpoint. It will not lead to a deeper understanding of the emptiness of name and form. Commonly, I just want to underline the importance of this clarification here, that uh, phenomenological perspective that emerges in the early suttas is not about saying that everything is mind only. It is only about recognizing the importance of the mind. End of comment. Now, in the case of a pantomime, as already mentioned, a spectator has to imagine persons and things not found on the stage as if they are present, in order to make sense out of an act. Here too we have a similar situation. Name and form exist in relation to each other. What one sees through this intervention is the emptiness or insubstantiality of both. We brought up all these analogies of dramas and film shows just to give an idea of the impermanence of sankharas or preparations. In fact, the term sankhara is very apt in the context of dramas and film shows. It is suggestive of a pretense sustained with some sort of effort. It clearly brings out their false and unreal nature. The purpose of the perception of impermanence with regard to this drama of existence is the dispelling of the perception of permanence about the things that go to make up the drama. With the dispelling of the perception of permanence, the tendency to grasp a sign or catch a theme is removed. It is due to the perception of permanence that one grasps a sign in accordance with perceptual data. When one neither takes a sign nor gets carried away by its details, there is no aspiration, expectation, or objective by way of craving. When there is no aspiration, one cannot see any purpose or essence to aim at. It is through the three deliverances, the signless, the desireless, and the void, that the drama of existence comes to an end. The perception of impermanence is the main contributory factor for the cessation of this drama. Some of the discourses of the Buddha concerning the destruction of the world 
can be cited as object lessons in the development of the perception of impermanence leading to the signless deliverance. For instance, in the discourse on the appearance of the seven suns, Sakti Surya Sutta, mentioned earlier, this world system, which is so full of valuable things like the seven kind of jewels, gets fully consumed in a holocaust, leaving not even a trace of ash or soot, as if some ghee or oil has been burnt up. The perception of impermanence arising out of this description automatically leads to an understanding of voidness. If the conviction that not only the various actors and actresses on the world stage, but all the accompanying their creations get fully destroyed, together with the stage itself, at some point of time, grips the mind with sufficient intensity to exhaust the influxes of sensuality, existence and ignorance, emancipation will occur then and there. That may be the reason why some attained Aranthold immediately on listening to that sermon. That way, the perception of impermanence acts as an extremely powerful antidote for defilements. Anicca sanya bhikkave bhavita bahulikata sabbang kama ragang pariyadiyati sabbang rupa ragang pariyadiyati sabbang bhava ragang pariyadiyati sabbang avijyang pariyadiyati Sabbang asmi manam pariyadiyati sammuhanati. Monks, the perception of impermanence, when developed and intensely practiced, exhausts all attachment to sensuality, exhausts all attachment to form, exhausts all attachment to existence, exhausts all ignorance, exhausts all conceits of an M, and eradicates it completely. Comment, translation by Bikubodi. When the perception of impermanence is developed and cultivated, it eliminates all sensual lust, it eliminates all lust for existence, it eliminates all ignorance, it uproots all conceit I am. And here I am also giving the Chinese parallel which makes basically the same statement. So there is no question at all that from the viewpoint of early Buddhism the perception of impermanence is an important and central aspect of the cultivation of insight and it leads to the full realization of emptiness which is when all defilements, when the mind has been emptied from all defilements and all idea, conceit of an I am has disappeared with the elimination of all ignorance. End of comment. This shows how the perception of impermanence gradually leads to an understanding of voidness, as is clearly stated in the following quotation. Anicca sanyino bhikngave bhikngono anatta sanya santati Monks in one who has the perception of impermanence, the perception of not-self gets established. With the perception of not-self, he arrives at the destruction of the conceit M, which is extinction here and now. Comment. Translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. When one perceives impermanence, the perception of non-self is stabilized. One who perceives non-self eradicates the conceit I am, which is Nibbana in this very life. And I have added the uh, Madhyama Agma parallel, which again says pretty much the same thing. End of comment. Such an assessment of the importance of the perception of impermanence will enable us to make sense out of the seemingly contradictory statements in some of the verses in the Dhammapada, such as the following. Putta matanti dhanang matanti itibalo vihanyati atta hi atta no natanti kutukutta kutu dhanam. Sons I have, wealth I have, so the fool is vexed. Even oneself is not oneself. Where then are sons worth wealth? Comment, translation by K. Norman. Thinking, I have sons, I have wealth, the fool is tormented. He is indeed no self of his own. How much less sons, how much less wealth. End of quote. The perception of not-self at its highest gives rise to the idea of voidness, as implied by the dictum sunyamidam atenava atantanyenava. This is empty of self or anything belonging to a self. 
Some are afraid of this term sunyata, emptiness, voidness, for various reasons. That is why we mentioned at the very outset, already in the first sermon, that gradually the monks themselves showed a lack of interest in those discourses that deal with the idea of voidness. The Buddha had already predicted as a danger that will befall the sasana in the future, this lack of regard for such discourses. This prediction reveals the high degree of importance attached to them. The last two sections of the Sutta Nipata, namely Attaka Vagga and Parayana Vagga, abound in extremely deep sermons. In the Parayana Vagga, for instance, we find the Brahmin youth, Mogaraja, putting the following question to the Buddha. Katang lokang avekantang machuraja napasati. By looking upon the world in which manner can one escape the eye of the king of death? The Buddha gives the answer in the following verse. Sunyato lokang avekasu mogaraja sadasato attang dinting uhacha evang machutarosiya. Evang lokang avekantang machuraja napasati. Look upon the world as void, mogaraja, being mindful at all times. Uprooting the lingering view of self, get well beyond the range of death. He who thus looks upon the world, the king of death, gets no chance to see. Comment. Translation by Bhikkhu Look upon the world as empty, Mogaraja, being ever mindful. Having uprooted the view of self, one may thus cross over death. The king of death doth not see one who looks upon the world thus. End of quote. From this we can infer that the entire Dhamma, even like the world system itself, inclines towards voidness. This fact is borne out by the following significant quotation in the Chula Tanha Sankaya Sutta, cited by Saka as an aphorism given by the Buddha himself. Sabidhamma Nalanga Vinivesaya, though we may render it simply as nothing is worth clinging on to, it has a deeper significance. The word Abhinivesa is closely associated with the idea of entering into or getting entangled in views of one's own creation. The implication then is that not only the views as such but nothing at all is worthwhile getting entangled in. This is suggestive of the emptiness of everything. This brings us to a very important sutta among the eights of the Anguttara Nikaya, namely the King Mulaka Sutta. In this particular sutta, we find the Buddha asking the monks how they would answer a set of questions which wandering ascetics of other sects might put to them. The questions are as follows. King Mulaka Vusa Sambhidhamma, King Sambhava Sambhidhamma, King Samudaya Sambhidhamma, King Samosarana Sambhidhamma, King Pamukka Sambhidhamma, Kim Adipateya Sabbidhamma, King Uttara Sabbidhamma, King Sarata Sabbidhamma. What is the root of all things? What is the origin of all things? Where do all things arrive? Towards what do all things converge? What is at the head of all things? What dominates all things? What is the point of transcendence of all things? What is the essence of all things? The monks confess that they are unable to answer those questions on their own and beg the Buddha to instruct them. Then the Buddha gave the exact answer to each question in a cut and dried form, saying, This is the way you should answer if wandering ascetics of other sects raise those questions. Chanda Mulaka Vusu Sambhidhamma, Manasikara Sambhava Sambhidhamma, Hasa Samudaya Sambhidhamma, Vedana Samosarana Sabbe Dhamma, Samadhi Pamukka Sabbe Dhamma, Satari Patteya Sabbe Dhamma, Panyuttara Sabbe Dhamma, Vimuttisara Sabbe Dhamma. 
Rooted in desire, friends, all things. Born of attention, all things. <coughs> Arisen from contact, all things. Converging on feeling, all things. Headed by concentration, all things. Dominated by mindfulness, all things. Surmountable by wisdom, all things. Yielding deliverance as essence, all things. Comment. Translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Friends, all things are rooted in desire. They come into being through attention. They originate from contact. They converge upon feeling. They are headed by concentration. Mindfulness exercises authority over them. Wisdom is their supervisor. Liberation is their core. And here the whole passage from the Madhyama Arma parallel. If heterodox practitioners ask you what is the root of all phenomena, you should answer them in this way. All phenomena have desire as the root. If they ask further what connects all phenomena, you should answer in this way. Contact connects all phenomena. If they ask further from what do they come, you should answer in this way. They come from feeling. If they ask further because of what do they exist, you should answer in this way. They exist because of intentions and perceptions. If they ask further, what is their leader? You should answer in this way. Mindfulness is their leader. If they ask further, what is foremost among them? You should answer in this way. Concentration is foremost among them. If they ask further, what is supreme among them? You should answer in this way. Wisdom is supreme among them. If they ask further, what is their true essence? You should answer in this way. Liberation is their true essence. If they ask further, what is their culmination? You should answer in this way. Nirvana is their culmination. Thus, monks, desire is the root of all phenomena. Contact connects them. They come from feelings. They exist because of intentions and perceptions. Mindfulness is their leader. Concentration is foremost among them. Wisdom is supreme among them. Liberation is their true essence and nirvana is their culmination. I wanted to mention that this um, Madhima Agama discourse is actually parallel to two Anguttara Nikaya discourses, the one we have just seen and another one that instead occurs among the tens and has two more items in its list. And I have discussed this in my article on selected Madhyama Agama discourse passages and their Pali parallels on page 29 following. I think this is already available on the forum. End of comment. Before getting down to an analysis of the basic meaning of this discourse, it is worthwhile considering why the Buddha forestalled a possible perplexity among his disciples in the face of a barrage of questions likely to be leveled by other sectarians. Why did he think it fit to prepare the minds of the disciples well in advance of such a situation? Contemporary ascetics of other sects, notably the Brahmins, entertained various views regarding the origin and purpose of all things. Those who subscribed to a soul theory had different answers to questions concerning thinghood or the essence of a thing. Presumably it was not easy for the monks, with their not-self standpoint, to answer those questions to the satisfaction of other sectarians. That is why those monks confessed their incompetence and begged for guidance. It was easy for those of other sects to explain away the questions relating to the origin and purpose of things on the basis of their soul theory or divine creation. Everything came out of Brahma, and self is the essence of everything. No doubt, such answers were substantial enough to gain acceptance. Even modern philosophers are confronted with the intricate problem of determining the exact criterion of a thing. What precisely accounts for the thinghood of a thing? What makes it no thing? 
Unfortunately for the Sutta, its traditional commentators seem to have ignored the deeper philosophical dimensions of the above questionnaire. They have narrowed down the meaning of the set of answers recommended by the Buddha by limiting its application to wholesome mental states. The occurrence of such terms as Chanda, Sati, Samadhi and Panya had probably led them to believe that the entire questionnaire is on the subject of wholesome mental states. But this is a serious underestimation of the import of the entire discourse. It actually goes far deeper in laying bare a basic principle governing both skillful and unskillful mental states. Now, for instance, the first two verses of the Dhammapada bring out a fundamental law of psychology applicable to things both skillful and unskillful. Manopabangama dhamma manusitta manumaya. Both verses draw upon this fundamental principle. Nowadays, these two lines are variously interpreted, but the basic idea expressed is that all things have mind as their forerunner, mind as their chief, and they are mind made. This applies to both skillful and unskillful mental states. Comment? I just wanted to draw attention to a comparative study of these first two verses in the Dhammapada by Peter Skilling published in 2007. I've given the full information here. And an interesting finding is that the last uh, term in the Pali court, Manumaya, things are mind made as actually not found in the parallels. End of comment. Now the Sutta in question has also to be interpreted in the same light, taking into account both these aspects. It must be mentioned in particular that with the passage of time a certain line of interpretation gained currency, according to which such terms as chanda were taken as skillful in an exclusive sense. For instance, the term sati, wherever and whenever it occurred, was taken to refer to samma sati. Likewise, chanda came to be interpreted as kusala chanda, desire or interest in the skillful, or kattu kamyata chanda, desire to perform. <clears throat> what we have to reckon with a special trait in the Buddha's way of preaching. His sermons were designed to lead onwards the listeners, gradually, according to their degree of understanding. Sometimes the meaning of a term, as it occurs at the end of a sermon, is different from the meaning it is supposed to have at the beginning of the sermon. Such a technique is also evident. The term chanda is one that has both good and bad connotations. In such context as chandaraga or chandajangagha, it is suggestive of craving as the cause of all suffering in this world. It refers to that attachment, raga, which the world identifies with craving as such. But in the context chandidipada, where the reference is to a particular base for success, it is reckoned as a skillful mental state. However, that is not a sufficient reason to regard it as something alien to the generic sense of the term. There is an important sutta which clearly reveals this fact in the Sanyutta Nikaya. A Brahmi named Unnabha once came to Venerable Ananda with a question that has a relevance to the significance of the term Chanda. His question was, so, Ananda, what is the purpose for which the holy life is lived under the recluse Gautama? Venerable Ananda promptly gives the following answer. Chandapahanatanko Brahmana Bhagavati Brahmacharyam Vusati. Brahman, it is for the abandonment of desire that the holy life is lived under the exalted one. Then the Brahmin asks, Atmatipana bhuananda mango atmatipatipada etasa chandasa pahanaya. Is there, sir Ananda, a way or practice for the abandonment of this desire? Venerable Ananda says, yes. Now, what is the way he mentions in that context? It is none other than the four bases for success, idipada, which are described as follows. 
ಛಂದಸಮಾಧಿಪಧಾನಸಂಕಾರಸಮನ್ನಾಗರಂ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಪಾರಂ ಭಾವತೆ ವಿನಯಸಮಾಧಿಪಧಾನಸಂಕಾರಸಮನ್ನಾಗರಂ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಪಾರಂ ಭಾವತೆ ಚಿತ್ತಸಮಾಧಿಪಧಾನಸಂಕಾರಸಮನ್ನಾಗರಂ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಪಾರಂ ಭಾವತೆ ವಿಮಾಂಸಮಾಧಿಪಧಾನಸಂಕಾರಸಮನ್ನಾಗರಂ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಪಾರಂ ಭಾವತೆ ಒನ್ ಡಿವೆಲಪ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಬೇಸಿಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸಕ್ಸಸ್ ದೆಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ವೊಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರಿಪರೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಲೀಡಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಅ ಕಾನ್ಸಂಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಡಿಸೈನ್ one develops the basics for the basis for success that has volition of preparations leading to a concentration through energy one develops the basis for success that has volition of preparations leading to a concentration by making up the mind one develops the basis for success that has volition of preparations leading to a concentration through investigation comment translation by vikram bodhi A bhikkhu develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to desire and volitional formations of striving. He develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to energy, concentration due to mind, concentration due to investigation and volitional formations of striving. End of comment. <coughs> Venerable Ananda replies, that the way of practice to be followed for the abandonment of desire is the above mentioned four bases pertaining to desire energy mind and investigation the brahman is puzzled at this reply he thinks if that is so desire is not abandoned it is still there and he raises this objection to show that there is an implicit contradiction chande neva chandang pajahisati iti netam thanam vidyati that one abandons desire by desire itself is an impossibility then the venerable ananda brings out a simile to convince the brahmin of the implicit truth in his reply what do you think brahmin is it not the case that you early had the desire i will go to the park and after you came here the appropriate desire subsided So this is the logic behind the statement concerning the abandonment of craving. The term chanda is used here in the first instance with reference to that type of craving for the purpose of the abandonment of craving. The desire as a basis for success is developed for the very abandonment of desire. So there's no question about the use of the same word. Here chanda as a basis of success still belongs to the chanda family a desire should be there even for the abandonment of desire this is a distinctive basic principle underlying the middle path common yeah i just would like to underline the importance of this uh, comment made by venbanyananda because i have often come across that uh, idea in modern western practitioner circles that one should simply have no desire at all and that therefore it Uh, is discouraged to have any desire for personal improvement or reaching the final goal and such an attitude is uh, similar to the topic of impermanence taken up at the beginning of the lecture a uh, reflection of certain developments in later buddhist traditions but it does not square and does not concord with the perspective that is evident in early buddhist thought end of comment Some have a great liking for the word chanda but dislike the word tanha so much so that if one speaks of a craving for attaining nibbana it might even be regarded as a blasphemy in another sermon given by venerable himself one addressed to a particular sikh nun we find the statement tanman nisaya tanha bahata ba depending on craving one should abandon craving comment i am giving the full statement here in first in pali tanha sambhoga yang bhagini kayo tanang nisaya tanha pahatamba and the same statement is made previously for ahara nutriment and subsequently for mana conceit and for those of you who know a little pali you can see that there is a, a somewhat of an ambiguity in the construction Uh, in what sense this tanang nisaya tanapa tabba should be understood and this 
ambiguity comes out if we compare two translations. So here is the translation by Vico Bodhi. This body has originated from craving. In dependence on craving, craving is to be abundant. And the earlier translation by Woodward. System, this body has come into being through craving, is dependent on craving. Craving must be abundant. So the question is whether this Tanhang Nisaya should be related to the body or is related to the abandoning of craving. And you, as we can see, the two translators take it differently. My personal preference would be for the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi, but the point is just to show that there are different ways of taking it. And so it is, of course, interesting to see what the Chinese parallel does. And so when we look at the first uh, 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 part of the Chinese parallel, it clearly supports the idea of associating the depending on craving to the body. This uh, and the way it formulates this is always with this the the the, 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 the dependency relates to to the body. But then the fascinating thing is that a little bit later in the same uh, Samyukta Agama parallel, then we eventually come to the statement that independence on craving, craving should be abundant. The, fi the very final statement here, this is called independence on craving, abundant craving, is the final statement. So in, in this case, the Samyukta Agama Para does not help us to decide, but uh, shows us that both interpretations are apparently possible from the viewpoint of the Samyukta Agama Para. Very interesting. I found that. End of comment. That again is suggestive of a special application of the middle path technique. But the kind of craving meant here is not something crude. It is specifically explained there that it is the longing arising in one for the attainment of Aranthood on hearing that someone has already attained it. Of course, there is a subtle trace of craving even in that longing, but it is one that is helpful for the abandonment of craving. So one need not fight shy of the implications of these words. As a matter of fact, even the word Radhi, attachment, is used with reference to Nibbana. When, for instance, it is said that the disciple of the Buddha is attached to the destruction of craving, Tanhatan Kayara Tuhoti Samma Sambuddha Savako, it may sound rather odd because the word Rati usually stands for lust. However, according to the middle path principle of utilizing one thing to eliminate another, words like Chanda and Tanha are used with discretion. Sometimes term like, terms like Nekkamasita Domanasa, unhappiness based on renunciation, are employed to indicate the desire for attaining Nibbana. Therefore, the statement Chanda Mulaka Sabbi Dhamma need not be interpreted as referring exclusively to skillful mental states. With regard to the significance of sati and samadhi, too, we may mention in passing that terms like mitcha sati, wrong mindfulness, and mitcha samadhi, wrong concentration, do sometimes occur in the discourse. Comment. Yeah, this is a very important observation, particularly the fact that the discourse has recognized wrong mindfulness, which of course could not be wholesome. And this stands in contrast to the commentary of Theravada tradition, which considers mindfulness as an invariable, wholesome mental state. And this in combination with the idea of the momentariness of mental states, then leads to the position that mindfulness and the defilement cannot coexist in the same mental state. Because one mental state must be either completely wholesome or completely unwholesome. And this then leads to the idea of considerable impact on actual mindfulness practice, that mindfulness of the presence of a state of lust or anger is necessarily always retrospective. And this is 
different from the view and perspective that emerges from the early discourses, where the instructions in the Satipatthana Sutta are very clearly about being aware of an unwholesome condition in the mind in the present moment. And the commentary I take here, in my personal view, risks missing out on an important, elementarily important aspect of Satipatthana practice, which is precisely witnessing with mindfulness the presence of something unwholesome in the mind right here and now. End of quote. So let us examine whether the set of statements under consideration has any sequential coherence or depth. Rooted in desire, friends, are all things. We might as well bring out the meaning of these statements with the help of an illustration. Supposing there's a heap of rubbish and someone approaches it with a basket to collect it and throw it away. Now about the rubbish heap, he has just a unitary notion. That is to say, he takes it as just one heap of rubbish. But as he bends down and starts collecting it into the basket, he suddenly catches sight of a gem. Now the gem becomes the object of his desire and interest. A gem arose out of what earlier appeared as a rubbish heap. It becomes the thing for him. And desire was at the root of this phenomena, true to the dictum, rooted in desire, friends, are all things. Then, what about origination through attention? It is through attention that the gem came into being. One might think that the origin of the gem should be traced to the mind, or to some place where it took shape. But the Buddha traces its origin in accordance with the norm Mano Pubangama Dhamma. Mind is the forerunner of all things. So then, the root is desire, and the source of origin is attention the very fact of attending. Pasa samudaya sabbe dhamma. All things arise from contact. There was eye contact with the gem, as something special out of all the things in the rubbish heap. So the gem arose from eye contact. Vidana samosarana sabbe dhamma. All things converge on feeling. As soon as the eye spotted the gem, a lot of pleasant feelings about it arose in the mind. Therefore, all things converge on feeling. Samadhi pamukha sabbe dhamma. Headed by concentration are all things. Here, in this case, it may be wrong concentration. Mitcha samadhi. But all the same, it is some kind of concentration. It is now a concentration on the gem. It is as if his meditation has shifted from the rubbish heap to the gem. Sat adipatteya dhamma, dominated by mindfulness, all things. As to this dominance, undistracted attention is necessary for the maintenance of that thing which has now been singled out. Where there is distraction, attention is drawn to other things as well. That is why mindfulness is said to be dominant be it the so-called wrong mindfulness, but nonetheless it is now directed towards the gem. Now comes the decisive stage, that is the surmountability by wisdom, Panyuttara. Let us for a moment grant that some or other, even though wrong, Mitya, some kind of surrogate mindfulness and concentration has developed out of this situation. Now, if one wants to cross over in accordance with the Dhamma, that is, if one wants to attain Nibbana with his gem itself as the topic of meditation, one has to follow the hint given by the statement Panyuttara Sabbe Dhamma, surmountable by wisdom, our things. What one has to do now is to see through the gem, to penetrate it by viewing it as impermanent, fraught with suffering and not self, thereby arriving at the conviction that, after all, the gem belongs to the rubbish heap itself. The gem is transcended by the wisdom that it is just one item in this rubbish heap, that is, the world in its entirety. 
if one wins to the wisdom that this gem is something like a piece of charcoal to be destroyed in the holocaust at the end of a world period one has transcended that gem so then the essence of all things is not any self or soul as postulated by the brahmins deliverance is the essence in such discourses as the mahasaropama sutta the essence of this entire dhamma is said to be deliverance the very emancipation from all this to be rid of all this is itself the essence some seem to think that the essence is a heaping up of concepts and clinging to them but that is not the essence of this teaching it is the ability to penetrate all concepts thereby transcending them the deliverance resulting from transcendence is itself the essence with the cessation of that concept of a gem as some special thing a valuable thing separate from the rest of the world as well as of the ensuing heap of concepts by way of craving conceit and views the gem ceases to exist that itself is the deliverance it is the emancipation from the gem therefore vimutti sara sabbe dhamma deliverance is the essence of all things so then we have here a very valuable discourse which can even be used as a topic of insight meditation the essence of any mind object is the very emancipation from it by seeing it with wisdom considered in this light everything in the world is a meditation object that is why we find very strange meditation topics mentioned in connection with the attainments of ancient arahant monks and nuns sometimes even apparently unsuitable meditation objects have been successfully employed meditation teachers as a rule do not approve of certain meditation objects for beginners with good reason for instance they would not recommend a female form as a meditation object for a male and a male form for a female that is because it can arouse lust since it is mentioned in the theragata that lust arose in some monk even on seeing a decayed female corpse in a cemetery but in the same text one comes across an episode in connection with venerable nagasamala which stands in utter contrast to it venerable nagasamala attained aranthut with the help of a potentially pernicious meditation object as he describes it in his words one summer begging bound I happened to look up to see a dancing woman, beautifully dressed and bedecked, dancing to the rhythm of an orchestra just on the middle of the highway. And what happened then? Tatome manasikaro yoniso buddha panjata adina mo patu rahu nibbida samatikta tato chittang vimucci me passa dhamma sudhammata. Just then, radical attention arose from within me. The perils were manifest, and dejection took place. Then the mind got released. Behold the goodness of the known. Common translation by Norman. Then reason thinking arose in me. The peril became clear. And disgust with the world was established. Then my mind was released. See the essential rightness of the doctrine. End of comment. If one wishes to discover the goodness of this known, one has to interpret the sutta in question in a broader perspective, without limiting its application to skillful mental states. If a train of thoughts had got started up upon that gem, even through a wrong concentration, and thereby a wrong mindfulness and a wrong concentration had taken shape, at whatever moment radical attention comes on the scene, Complete reorientation occurs instantaneously, true to those qualities of the Dhamma implied by the term Sandiktika, visible here and now, Akalika, not involving time, and Epasika, inviting one to come and see. Some might wonder, for instance, how those Brahmins of old, who had practiced their own methods of concentration, attained Arahanthut on hearing just one stanza as soon as they came to the Buddha. The usual interpretation is that it is due to the miraculous powers of the Buddha, or else that the persons concerned had an extraordinary stock of merit. 
The miracle of the Dhamma, implicit in such occurrences, is often ignored. Now, as to this miracle of the Dhamma, we may take the case of someone keen on seeing a rainbow. He will have to go on looking at the sky indefinitely, waiting for a rainbow to appear. But if he is wise enough, he can see the spectrum of rainbow colors through a dewdrop hanging on a leaf of a creeper, waving in the morning sun, provided he finds the correct perspective. For him, the dewdrop itself is the meditation object. In the same way, one can sometimes see the entire Dhamma, 37 factors of enlightenment and the like, even in a potentially pernicious meditation object. From an academic point of view, the two terms Yoniso Manasikara, radical attention, and Ayoniso Manasikara, non-radical attention, are in utter contrast to each other. There is a world of difference between them. So also between the terms Samma Ditti, right view, and Mitcha Ditti, wrong view. But from the point of view of realization, there is just a little difference. Now as we know, that spectrum of the sun's rays in the dewdrop disappears with a very little shift in one's perspective. It appears only when viewed in a particular perspective. What we find in this Dhamma is something similar. This is the intrinsic nature of this Dhamma that is to be seen here and now, timeless, leading onward, and realizable by the wise, each one by himself. Our interpretation of this Sutta taking the word sabbi dhamma to mean all things, is further substantiated by the Samidhi Sutta, found in the section on the nines in the Anguttara and Nikaya. It is a discourse preached by Venerable Sariputta. To a great extent, it runs parallel to the one we have already analyzed. The difference lies only in a few details. In that sutta we find the Venerable Samidhi answering the questions put to him by Venerable Sariputta, like a pupil at a catechism. The following is the gist of questions raised and answers given. Kimma Ramana Samidhi Purisasa Sankapa Vitaka Upadjanti Nama Rupa Ramana Bhante Tipana Samidhi Kvana Nattangat Chanti Dhatu Subhante Tipana Samidhi King Samudayati Passa samudaya bhante. Te pana samiddhi king samosar nati. Vedana samosar na bhante. Te pana samiddhi king pamukati. Samani pamuka bhante. Te pana samiddhi king adipatte yati. Sata adipatte ya bhante. Te pana samiddhi king uttarati. Panyuttara bhante. Te pana samiddhi king sarati, vimutti sara bhante. Te pana samiddhi king ogadhati, amattu gadha bhante. Except for the first two questions and the last one, the rest is the same as in the questionnaire given by the Buddha. But from this catechism, it is extremely clear that Venabhasadi Putta is asking about thoughts and concepts. In the case of the previous sutta, one could sometimes doubt whether the word sabbi dhamma refers to skillful or unskillful mental states. But here it is clear enough that when Masariputta's questions are on thoughts and concepts, let us not try to translate the above catechism. With modernist objects, samidhi, no concepts and thoughts arise in a man with name and form as object universal. But where some indeed do they assume diversity in the elements universal? But from what some indeed do they arise? They arise from contact universal. But on what some indeed do they converge? They converge on feeling universal. But what some indeed is at their head? They are headed by concentration universal. But by what Samiddhi are they dominated? They are dominated by mindfulness Venerasa. But what Samiddhi is their highest point? Wisdom is their highest point Venerasa. But what Samiddhi is their essence? Deliverance is their essence Venerasa. But in what Samiddhi do they get merged? 
they get merged in the deathless Brahman soul. Good. Translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. On what basis, Samiddhi, do intentions and thoughts arise in a person on the basis of name and form bandha? Where do they become diversified in relation to the elements? From what do they originate? They originate from contact. Upon what do they converge? They converge upon feeling. By what are they headed? They are headed by concentration. What exercises authority over them? Mindfulness exercises authority over them. What is their supervisor? Wisdom is their supervisor. What is their core? Liberation is their core. In what do they culminate? They culminate in the deathless. End of comment. Some noteworthy points emerge from this catechism. <coughs> All concepts and thoughts have name and form as their object. The 18 elements account for their diversity. They arise with contact. They converge on feeling. They are headed by concentration. They are dominated by mindfulness. Their akana, or point of transcendence, is wisdom. Their essence is deliverance and they get merged in the deathless. Be it noted that the deathless is a term for Nibbana. Therefore, as we have stated above, everything has the potentiality to yield the deathless, provided radical attention is ushered in. It is indubitably clear from this catechism that the subject under consideration is concepts and thoughts. All mind objects partake of the character of concepts and thoughts. Therefore, the mind objects, according to the Buddha, have to be evaluated on the lines of the above-mentioned normative principles and not on the lines of self-essence and divine creation as postulated by Tsung theories. In accordance with the dictum, mind is the forerunner of all things, manupupangama dhamma, the course of training advocated by the Buddha, which begins with name and form as object, reaches its consummation in seeing through name and form, that is, in its penetration. It culminates in the transcendence of name and form by penetrating into its impermanent, suffering, fraught and not-self nature. This fact is borne out by the discourses already quoted. The essence of the teaching is release from name and form. When one rightly understands the relation between name and form as well as their emptiness, one is able to see through name and form. This penetration is the function of wisdom. So long as wisdom is lacking, consciousness has a tendency to get entangled in name and form. This is the insinuation of the following Dhammapada verse about the Arant. Kodang jahe vipta jahe yamanam sang yojanam sap bang atikkameya tang nama rupas ming asanjamanam akinchanam nanupatanti dukkha. Let one put wrath away, conceit abundant, and get well beyond all fetters as well. That one untrammeled by name and form, with naught as his own, nor pains before. Common translation by Akira Norman. One should abandon anger, one should give off pride, one should pass beyond every attachment. Sufferings do not befall one who is not attached to name and form, possessing nothing. End of comment. The path shown by the Buddha, then, is one that leads to the transcendence of name and form by understanding its emptiness. In this connection, the Brahma Jala Sutta of the Diga Nikaya reveals a very important fact on analysis. What it portrays is how the 62 wrongdoers lose their luster in the light of wisdom, emanating from the non-manifestative consciousness of the Buddha which is lustrous on all sides, Sambhata Pabha. As to how a luster could be superseded, we have already explained with reference to a film show. The film show lost its luster when the doors were flung open. 
The narrow beam of light directed on the cinema screen faded away completely before the greater light now coming from outside. Similarly, the 62 wrong views in the Brahma Jhana Sutta are seen to fade away before the light of wisdom coming from the non-manifestative consciousness of the Buddha. The narrow beams of 62 wrong views faded in the broader flood of light that is wisdom. Those heretics who propounded those wrong views conceived them by dogmatically holding on to name and form. They got entangled in name and form, and those views were the product of speculative logic based on it. We come across an allusion to this fact in the Mahaviyuha Sutta of the Sutta Nipata. There it is declared that those of other sects are not free from the limitations of name and form. Pasang naro dakngiri nama rupang disvana vanyasati thani meva kamang pahong pasatu appakang va nahi tena suddhing kusalavadanti A seeing man will see only name and form. Having seen, he will know just those constituents alone. Let him see much or little. Experts do not concede purity thereby. Common translation by Nikobodi. Seeing a person will see name and form. Having seen, it is just these that he will know. Granted, let him see much or little. The skillful say purity is not one in that way. End of comment. In the Brahma Jala Sutta itself, we find some views advanced by those who had higher knowledges. With the help of those higher knowledges, which were still of the mundane type, they would see into their past, sometimes hundreds of thousands of their past lives. And drawing also from their ability to read others' minds, they would construct various views. Many such views are recorded in the Brahma Jala Sutta only to be rejected and invalidated. Why so? The reason is given here, in this verse. The man who claims to see with those higher knowledges is seeing only name and form. Pasanaro dagiti nama rupang. Having seen, he takes whatever he sees as real knowledge. Disvana vanyasati thani meva. Just as someone inside a closed room with tinted window panes sees only what is reflected in those dark panes and not beyond, even so those seers got enmeshed in name and form when they proceeded to speculate on what they saw as their past life. They took name and form itself to be real. That is why the Buddha declared that whether they saw much or little, it is of no use since experts do not attribute purity to that kind of vision. Kamang bahu pasatu appakang va nai tena sutling kusalavadanti Here it is clear enough that those narrow wrong views are based on name and form, assuming it to be something real. The Buddha's vision, on the other hand, is one that transcends name and form. It is a supramundane vision. This fact is clearly revealed by the implications of the very title of the Brahma Jala Sutta. At the end of the discourse, the Buddha himself compares it to an all-embracing supernet. Just as a clever fisherman would throw a finely woven net well over a small lake, so that all the creatures living there are caught in it as they come up, all the possible views in the world are enmeshed or forestalled by the supernet of Brahma Jala. Comment. I just uh, wanted to briefly look at uh, at who is the one who casts that supernet, <coughs> excuse me, the Brahmajala, which the Diganikaya does not explicitly say. And according to the commentary, the net is cast by the Buddha. But uh, the Sanskrit and two Tibetan uh, parallels I'm giving here, it is rather cast by Mara. And that seems to me also the more probable understanding 
that the Buddha simply explains the net in which these Brahmins are caught by speculating and giving rise to various views. I've discussed this in more detail in an article that also translates the Dirga Agama Parallel of the Examination of Views in the Brahma Jala Sutta and Views in the Tathagata, a comparative study and translation of the Brahma Jala in the Chinese Dirga Agama. And I will make this available in the forum for anyone who is interested to follow up more the Brahma Jala Sutta treatment in the light of its parallel, which is very interesting and powerful discourse on the basis of views, the holding on to views in feeling and contact. End of comment. Let us now pause to consider what the mesh of this net could be. If the Brahmajala Sutta is a net, what constitutes that fine mesh in this net? There is a word occurring all over the discourse which gives us a clear answer to this question. It is found in the phrase which the Buddha used to disqualify every one of those views, namely, Tadabi Pasapachaya, Tadabi Pasapachaya, and that too is due to contact, and that too is due to contact. So from this we can see that contact is the mesh of this net. The medley of wrong views, current among those of other sects, is the product of the six sense bases dependent on contact. The Buddha's vision, on the other hand, seems to be an all-encompassing luster of wisdom, born of the cessation of the six sense bases, which in effect is the vision of Nibbana. This fact is further clarified in the Sutta by the statement of the Buddha that those who cling to those wrong views based on name and form, keep on whirling within the samsaric round because of those very views. Sambete chahi passayatane pusa pusa patisang vedente. Te sang passa pachaya vidana vidana pachaya tanha tanha pachaya upadana upadana pachaya bhavo bhava pachaya jati jati pachaya jara maranam Sokaparidevadokadamanasupayasasambhavanti. They all continue to experience feeling coming into contact again and again with the six sense bases. And to them, dependent on contact, there's feeling. Dependent on feeding, there's craving. Dependent on craving, there's grasping. Dependent on grasping, there's becoming. Dependent on becoming, there's birth. And dependent on birth, decay, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. But when monks, a monk knows as they truly are, the arising, the going down, the satisfaction, the peril, and the stepping out concerning the six sense bases, that monk has a knowledge which is far superior to that of all those dogmatists. Comment, translation by Morris Walsh. With regard to all of these, they experience these feelings by repeated contact through the six sense bases. Feeding conditions craving, craving conditions clinging, clinging conditions becoming, Becoming conditions birth, birth conditions aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, sadness and distress. When monks, a monk understands as they really are the arising and passing away of the six bases of contact, the attraction, peril and the deliverance from them, he knows that which goes beyond all these views. And the relevant part from the Dirgaadama parallel, recluses and Brahmins, who give rise to a doctrine of internalism and declare that the world is eternal, they do so conditioned by feeling, which produces craving. Craving having arisen, they do not realize by themselves that they are being defiled by attachment to craving and are under the power of craving. Up to Nibbana here now. The rest is also to be recited further like this. What I've put here in italics, these are recitation remarks for those who are reciting the discourse that they have to now go through that whole
passage with all the other different views uh, that have been mentioned earlier. I continue. Recluses and Brahmins who, having views about the past and speculations about the past, give rise to a doctrine of eternalism, declaring that the world is eternal. They do so conditioned by contact. It is impossible to establish such a doctrine without contact, etc. If a monk knows, as it really is, the rising of the six spheres of contact, their cessation, their gratification, their disadvantage, and the escape from them, this is supreme and leads out of all those views. End of comment. This paragraph clearly brings out the distinction between those who held on to such speculative views and the one who wins to the vision made known by the Buddha. The former were dependent on contact, that is, sensory contact, even if they possessed worldly higher knowledges. Because of contact originating from the sixth sense basis, there is feeling. Because of feeling, they are lured into craving and grasping, which make them go round and round in samsara. The emancipated monk who keeps to the right path, on the other hand, wins to that synoptic vision of the six sense bases replete in its five aspects. That is what is known as the light of wisdom. To him, all five aspects of the six sense bases become clear, namely the arising, the going down, the satisfaction, the peril, and the stepping out. That light of wisdom is considered the highest knowledge precisely because it reveals all these five aspects of the six sense bases. The reference to the formula of dependent arising in the above passage is highly significant. It is clear proof of the fact that the law of dependent arising is not something to be explained with reference to a past existence. It is a law relevant to the present moment. This name and form is reflected on consciousness. Now as to this consciousness, the Nidana Samyutta of the Samyutta Nikaya, which is a section dealing with the law of dependent arising in particular, defines it in a way that includes all the six types of consciousness. Katamancha bhikkave vinyana, chayame bhikkave vinyana kaya, chakko vinyana, sota vinyana, dhana vinyana, jiva vinyana, kaya vinyana, mano vinyana. When one monk says consciousness, there are these six classes of consciousness. Eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness and mind consciousness. This monk is called consciousness. Comment and I am just giving here three parallels which all make the same statement. The only difference is that the uh, Ekotrika Agama, the last one, does not spell out the details. End of comment. This shows that the consciousness mentioned in the formula of dependent arising is not something like a relink in consciousness. The reference here is not just one consciousness. It is independence on name and form, reflected on all six types of consciousness that the six sense bases get established. The discrimination between an internal and an external is the outcome of the inability to penetrate name and form, to see through it. There is an apparent duality, I as one who sees, and name and form as the objects seen. Between them there is a dichotomy as internal and external. It is on this very dichotomy that the six sense bases are based. Feeling and all the rest of it come on top of those six sense bases. Craving and grasping follow suit, as a result of which those dogmatists get caught up in the vicious cycle of dependent arising and keep running round in samsara as the Buddha has declared. So then it becomes clear from the Brahmajala Sutta that such a wide variety of wrong views exist in this world due to the dogmatic involvement in name and form reflected on consciousness, that is by mistaking the reflection to be oneself. This in brief is tantamount to Sakkaya Dipti, or personality view. 
Now let us take up a parable by way of an illustration of the distinction between the wrong view of the dogmatists already analyzed and the right view, which is in complete contrast to it. It is an episode in the Ummaga Jataka which more or less looks like a parable to illustrate this point. In the Ummaga Jataka one comes across the problem of a gem. In that story there are in fact several such problems concerning gems and we are taking up just one of them. The citizens of Mithila came and informed King Videha that there is a gem in the pond near the city gate. The king commissioned his royal advisor Seneca with the task of taking out the gem. He went and got the people to empty the pond but failed to find the gem there. Even the mud was taken out and the earth dug up in a vain attempt to locate the gem. When he confessed his failure to the king, the latter entrusted the job to Bodhi Mahosada, the youngest advisor. When he went there and had a look around, he immediately understood that the gem is actually in a crow's nest on a palm tree near the pond. What appeared in the pond is only its reflection. He then convinced the king of this fact by getting a man to immerse a bowl of water into the pond, which also reflected the gem. Then the, man, then the man climbed up the palm tree and found the gem there as predicted by Mahosadha. If we take this episode as an illustration, the view of the dogmatists can be compared to Seneca's view. The discovery of the Buddha, that name and form is a mere reflection, is like the solution advanced by the Bodhisattva Mahosadha to the problem of the gem in the pond. Now, what is the role of personality view in this connection? It is said that the Buddha preached the Dhamma, adopting a via media between two extreme views. What are they? The eternalist view and the nihilist view. The eternalist view is like that attachment to the reflection. Sometimes when one sees one's own image in water, one falls in love with it, imagining it to be someone else as in the case of the dog on the plank mentioned in an earlier sermon. It can sometimes arouse hate as well. Thus there could be both self-love and self-hate. Inclining towards these two attitudes, the personality view itself leads to the two extreme views known as eternalism and nihilism, or annihilationism. It is like Seneca's attempt to find the gem by emptying the water and digging the bottom of the pond. The Buddha avoids both these extremes by understanding that this name and form is a reflection. Owing to the reflective nature of this point of consciousness, it has no essence. The name in this name and form, as we have already stated in an earlier sermon, is merely a formal name or an apparent name. And the form here is only a nominal form, a form only in name. There is neither an actual name nor substantial form here. Name is only apparent and form is only nominal. With this preliminary understanding, one has to arouse that wisdom by building up the ability to see through name and form in order to win to freedom from this name and form. So in this sermon, our special attention has been on name and form on the interrelation between name and form and consciousness. All this reveals to us the importance of the first two lines of the problematic verse already quoted. Vinyanan manidasanan anantan sambhatopaban Consciousness which is non-manifestative, endless, lustrous on all sides. According to the Buddha's vision, by fully comprehending the fact that name and form is a mere image or reflection, the non-manifestative consciousness develops the penetrative power to see through it. But those others who could not understand that it is a reflection aroused self-love and self-hate. It is as if one is trying to outstrip one's shadow by running towards it out of fun, while the other is trying to flee from it out of fear. Such is the nature of the two extreme views in this world. Obsessed by two views most are gods and men, some of whom lag behind 
while others overreach. Only if they do see, they have eyes to see. Comment, translation by Ireland. Because, held by two kinds of viewers, some devas and men hold back, and some overreach. Only those with vision see. End of comment. This is how the Itibutaka, the collection of the thus said in discourses, sums up the situation in the world. Some fall back and lag behind, while others overstep and overreach. It is only they that see who have eyes to see. Comment. Yeah, this time it was easy for me to identify as the salient point name and form because the Venerable Katakurundanyananda has stated this himself.